Hub Hopper Originals. To start your podcast for free, log on to studio.hubhopper.com. Hello everyone and welcome back to Indie Jeans. We have a very special episode for you today and our guest is someone that has been the American founder of Palm Computing and Handspring where he invented the Palm Pilot and Trio. He has since turned to work on neuroscience full time founding the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience formerly the Redwood Neuroscience Institute in 2002 and Numenta in 2005 he is currently chief scientist at Numenta where he leads a team in efforts to reverse engineer the neocortex and enable machine learning technology based on brain theory he is also the author of on intelligence which explains his memory prediction framework theory of the brain and in march 2021 released his second book a thousand brains a new theory of intelligence which details the discoveries he and numenta have made that have led to the thousand brains theory of intelligence in 2003 he was elected as a member of the national academy of engineering for the creation of the handheld computing paradigm and the creation of the first commercially successful example of a handheld computing device our conversation today was one of the most exciting ones i've had and i have to say that all through this conversation we go through the neocortex we go through the old brain implications of ai future of ai and everything you ever wanted to know about the human brain So without taking too much more of your time I now present to you a very special person and a guest that we're proud to have on Indian Genes none other than Jeff Hawkins Jeff it's an absolute pleasure to have you here from everyone in India and specifically Indian Genes where we are recording this podcast on we've been wanting to get you on earlier as well your book a thousand brains and the thousand brains theory is something that we're going to talk a lot about uh, later on as we get in but first of all thank you so much for agreeing to do this oh thank you akim i think it's great i'm a, it's a pleasure and honor to be on your show before we get into a, a little bit of the technical stuff uh, we want to start at the very beginning if we can and and the best place to start for me and for people listening is the forward in your book by richard dawkins i think that was stunning that itself lends so much of credibility to a lot of people out there we all know what you are doing but that must have been exciting for you as well it was um i've known richard a little bit not not very closely at all i've run into him a couple times and so i had to try to figure a way to get him to read the book and and just to get his feedback and and then um i t- i i emailed him again and said hey richard do you have a chance to look at that he goes yeah And then I said, "What you what, what do you think?" He said, "I like it." And then I said, "Well, then I had to get really bold and I said, "Would you think you might even consider writing, you know, a forward, you know?" And he goes, "Yeah, I'll think about that." And then I I contacted him again a little bit later and I said, "Richard, what about that forward?" He goes, "Oh, it's done. Here it is." <laughs> so, it was great. And of course, when I read it, it was very it's very complimentary. And um and I think he understood the all the aspects of the book uh, and its importance. So that was really exciting. Super exciting. And since uh, most of our listeners here are going to be students and mainly non-scientists, so I would call them non-experts. Before we even get into the research that you're doing and all the great stuff that you've been doing over the last 20 25 years, uh something that I noticed earlier as well is the initial story that uh, that you have before you actually got into all of this was very inspiring from wanting to join a specific university uh, not being able to get what you wanted to and life circles back where you were offered a position there uh, that would be a perfect place to start and just put a little bit of perspective to to this if that if the if you can do that yeah um so early on in my life right when i got out of college i fell in love with brains and i i decided i really wanted to study them for my life and i wanted to figure out how our brains work and so that seems like a you know a lot of people want to do that yeah um, um but what i was surprised when i really committed to doing it and got myself as into the university in a graduate program was that 
working on the big problem, like how's the whole brain work, was seemed too ambitious. And um, and you couldn't get funded for it. You couldn't get support for it. And I'm, and I was very much encouraged to work on a very small part, you know, in some lab studying some part of the brain, which is important work. Uh, but it's not what I wanted to do. I really wanted to tackle the big problems like, hey, how does this whole, what's going on in our heads? You know, how, how do we think? What, what's going on when I'm speaking right now? How, how do I even understand the world? You know, this is all just a bunch of cells in your head doing this. And there's got to be an explanation. Anyway, so that I was, it was very, in, in hindsight, it worked out great. But at the time, it was very frustrating. And it was very difficult for me because Basically, I was told I couldn't do this, and um, and as you know, as a 22 year old kid, you don't really know what you're able to do, and um, and and you have to. It's hard to push through these problems. Um, so that's that's how this whole thing started. I just said, oh, I got to work on this problem. Everyone agrees how the brain works is one of the most important problems in, in the world, and yet I was being told it was too ambitious to work on, and that I couldn't really pursue it. Uh, surprisingly, um, so. That led to a whole very long career path, uh, which we could talk about if you want, about how I figured, how am I going to get around to doing this? You know, how am I actually going to, you know, work on the problem I want to work on that everyone agrees should be solved, but but it was obstacles in my way. Right. I, I think we'd like to hear that as well, because that would help a lot of us uh, yeah. in whatever projects or obstacles do come. So when you approach this, like you said, at 22, you would have been really interested in this, and then you would have had to say, okay, I've got to probably give this up for some time or this was always yeah. in the back of your mind and yes, you were yes. working it was, towards something? I didn't, so it was, I, I really didn't know what to do. Look, when you're young, you don't really know how to do these things, right? So here I was, I, I had been working in Silicon Valley in the computing industry or I'd been working for Intel and I, first for a couple of years out of college and I said, okay, I'm going to go become a graduate student. I, I, I got big, I was in the graduate program of neuroscience at Berkeley and I show up and I write a paper uh, for the for the head of the graduate program. I said, this is what I want to study for my PhD. And I said, here's, I want to study these aspects of the neocortex and how it works. And he said, this is great, but you can't do it. And and it took me a while to sink in, as I mentioned a moment ago, like why I can't do it. Because it can't get funding. It seemed too risky. You might not graduate, all these things. So then I had to come up with a plan. And at first I didn't know what to do. So I just, for two years, I basically did some consulting as a computer programmer and i i studied on my own i would go to the library this is before we had the internet and i have to go to the university library twice a week i get all these papers i read them so i educated myself but eventually i had to do something so i put a plan in place which was okay i'm going to go back to work in the computing industry for i thought four years um and after four years i will can afford to and i'll mature and maybe neuroscience would change and maybe i'll try again um and so that was my plan. And um, what kind of messed up the plan a bit was uh, going back to the computing industry, I started having a lot of success as an entrepreneur in the computing industry. And so along the way, I ended up starting um, uh, some uh, pretty significant companies. The first was Palm Computing, which we, we designed the first handheld computers, Palm Pilot, and then Handspring. We did some of the first smartphones, the Trio. And, um, and so I had this, all of a sudden I had this, these large businesses that I helped create and I, st all along, I wanted to go back to neuroscience all along. Everybody knew this. Everybody worked for me knew that just, you know, my first passion was neuroscience and that I was looking for an opportunity to go back. And so at some point I just had to say, you know, I can't go on forever. I have to go do the neuroscience thing. And I just kind of left. I, I, I planned it out. I said, look, in a year I'm going to be, you know, leaving these, these businesses and, um, I'm going to go um, back into neuroscience, not even knowing how I was going to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But at the time, I had already made some friends in the neuroscience community, and several of them had expressed a similar type of frustration with me that it's so hard to work on the big problems, that you can't get government funding for it, you, know, you, you, you can't be too ambitious. And they encouraged me to start a neuroscience institute. And I said, like, I don't know how to start an institute. You know, yes, I've started a couple companies, but I've never run a, a, a science institute. And so they said, we'll help you. And I said, okay, I'll, we'll do it. And so we, we, we created the Redwood Neuroscience Institute. And then we, we had a bunch of like 10 scientists there for, um, for several years working. Uh, eventually, I started my own uh, lab company called Nementa, which is where I am now. Um, and uh, it's more of a dedicated, um, uh, more, of a, more singular uh, dedicated uh, research lab.
that that's amazing because even even right here at the beginning i have a very interesting question for you because you said your interest was uh, neuroscience and then you decided to move to computing or to the computing industry now does this at the very beginning tell us that there is some correlation here because if you were interested in neuroscience you could have still decided to get into any other industry but the fact that by default you said neuroscience and then computing so is that connected somewhere well, not or, really or, or, well Kim, it was like it was i had you know i studied electrical engineering in college and as my undergraduate and um and i had started as i mentioned I, my first job was at intel so i i worked for intel for like two years and i and i had um uh you know so i was, I was already doing that and so to me going back to the computers was something i was familiar with something i could do i didn't have to start over um and it's something I felt I was reasonably talented at. So it's like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> it's like, um, okay. It wasn't, I, it, to me, at the time, I, you know, I didn't really understand much about brains and uh, how they work. And so I, you know, I, never, I knew they weren't computers. I knew that. I said, this is not a computer. The thing in our head is not a computer. It's, it's, it's something completely different and uh, it works on different principles. And so I didn't, I didn't see that connection there. And I still don't. I think they're quite different uh, machines. Um, but I think it's helpful when you, uh, the kind of thinking you have to do to think about computers and understand how they work, it's the same kind of thinking you have to do to understand how a system like a brain works. It's an information processing system and, uh, it works on certain principles and you can understand those principles. They're very different in the case of brains and computers, but, um, the same kind of, uh, brain, my brain could work on both those problems. And you're brilliant. I have to say you're brilliant. Uh, <laughs> book, the thousand, uh, the thousand brain theory. It uh, it seriously got me thinking. I, I probably spent uh, I I had to finish it in in a night because I couldn't put it down. <laughs> it got me late to work the next day. And one thing that I found so interesting was first of all is the language and the way you approached it. So the part that I liked best was after every uh, section you would recap. And I found that so interesting because generally you don't get that in books. You move on. But the fact that at the end of every uh, uh, part of your book, you would recap that particular chapter and then we would and you would do that again at the beginning of the next one as well. That yeah. was so, so reinforcing because sometimes people put out, uh, put a book down after some time. And would you agree with me that uh, your book in 2004 on intelligence we don't necessarily need to read that to start here, right? We could, we that's could right. start it's, fresh it, right Yeah, here. you can start with the new book. Um, in fact, that's what I'd recommend. Um, um, it, it's in some sense, the new book uh, picks up a little bit where the old book left off, but it also covers the whole thing. So um, like in, in my first book on intelligence, I kind of laid out the problem of the brain and how we can think about it and why it's important to understand it. And I, I described the brain as sort of a machine that makes predictions and has to have some sort of model of the world. But in the new book, we understand how that model works. <laughs> and we didn't, I didn't really yep. know that 14 years ago. So yeah. Um, yeah, you don't need to read the first book, although I'm not thinking not to, but it's uh, you can just pick up a thousand brain. It's, it's designed for any sort of um, intellectually curious reader should be able to get through it. Um, I don't assume any prior uh, knowledge of neuroscience or any of these um, features. There's no math in the book. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's the ideas can be challenging because um, it may be thinking about the world differently than you're used to thinking about it. Um, but it's not a hard book to read, I think, um, in, 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 in some other technical way. Perfect. So I think let's let's jump in straight away and and get to the literally the meat of of, of the matter here. And when we talk about the brain, so you say before uh, getting into a lot of it here that before we even get into AI and probably we'll talk about AI and what's happening there a little bit later. I just want to start with a uh, simple brain functions. And you spoke about the neocortex, but I think uh, to me what part I found very interesting was the old brain. <laughs> and would you want to guide us through that and then we can come through the neocortex? Yeah, sure. I mean, a human brain, um, by the way, all mammals um, have a pretty much similar brain structures. It's just, our, they just, just different pieces or different sizes. So we can talk about humans, but we're talking about mammals in general. Um, but if you look at a human brain, in, it's got many different parts. It's, it's like multiple organs. It's not one thing. And, and these parts are highly interconnected. And they evolved um, at different times in the past. Um, you know, there's some are uh, newer from an evolutionary point of view, and some are much older. 
And of course, brains started early on. The very first brains were ones that just to regulate the body, you know, like uh, pump the blood or make, you know, you know, reflex reactions or make sure the temperatures are right and so on. And so you have a lot of these older brain structures which do basic bodily functions that you're generally not even aware of. You don't know how your body digests food and things like that. Um, and then, the, you know, over time, evolution added new new parts and new parts or m- morphed them. And so we have like, there's a dozen or two dozen different brain structures in our head. Um, and I, I group uh, uh, every, I, the biggest one by, by far in humans is the neocortex. It's, it's 70% of the brain and 30% of the brain, all these other p- things, um, um, I just casually, I group them all together and call them the old brain, which is a little bit casual about it, but, and they do all these different functions, everything from, you know, they control most of your emotional states, your reflex reactions, even something like walking is controlled by older parts of your brain. You don't really know how you walk or how you balance on your feet. Um, so there's a lot of these structures and, and I make this distinction because the, these are not the part, these are, these parts of the brain are very important for us being as humans, right? Uh, but they're not really the crux of intelligence. And, and, um, and if we think about it, if we want to understand how, you know, what intelligence is and how it works, we have to focus mostly on the neocortex. Um, it's not that the other parts of the brain aren't important uh, to a human, but um, from an intelligence point of view. Um, so, and now the old brain, unfortunately, has a lot of traits which we don't always think of as desirable. You know, um, from an evolutionary standpoint, a lot of things we think of um, as, as undesirable were valuable from an evolutionary standpoint. So, you know, aggression and cheating people or, you know, infidelity or, you know, um, uh, just there's a lot of things we can talk about violent behavior, which may at times been a successful evolutionary strategy, but we still live with these things. We all struggle with them. Um, you know, where our, where our neocortex is more the rational thinking part of the brain says, yeah, this is the way the world works, you know, and I should eat these foods because they're healthy or I shouldn't do this because it's best for everybody. But then your old brain kicks in and says, well, I'm going to eat this piece of cake anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we battle with this. All of us have to deal with this issue. So, so the old brain is more of the stabilizer, if I'm just trying to give it a general well, view. Well, it's, it's then- everything from body stasis, you know. Uh, maintaining your heart rate and your oxygen levels to basic reflex behaviors um, to your emotional states, your desires, the, you know, your, though all those things that, that are not just like, Hey, you know, you know, the neocortex is like, Hey, what's going on in the world? How do I understand it? And everything else in your body, like from, from your emotions down to your reflex behaviors uh, and bodily controls, I would call the old brain. Mm. And the neocortex that then, as you say, evolved over the old brain. Now, did this did this start happening somewhere, or we would go back to our evolution? And you're you're going way back. You're going past the uh, probably Homo habilis, so you're going right down to. I think the Neanderthals. We've now found out they already had emotions in some way or the other. But you would then go back to Australopithecus. But do we know at which part of our evolution this particular a neocortex started developing? Well, not really. There's a lot of people who study this and there are theories about it. Um, you know, anything struck, any structure like this, which is complex, doesn't just appear. It, it evolves from something else. Um, and, the, you know, one of the theories is that um, the neocortex evolved, and I, I subscribe to the theory too, and I mentioned in the book, um, that the, uh, the there's some older parts of the brain uh, that are called the, uh, the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus and these older part of the mm-hmm. brains are used for uh, mapping we keep track of where we are in the world they, they tell us where we are if i'm in a room or if i'm in a building and i know what, where i am i how, how do i know where i am it's, that's those parts of the brain that do that and there's a theory that says that the neo that the neocortex um started with that st- structure and evolved into a slightly different version of it um and, uh, and, and in fact, they're literally like aligned next to each other in the brain. And then uh, what's really interesting about the evolution of the, of the neocortex is that once, the, once nature sort of repackaged this thing that, uh, and, and made a new version of it, it made lots of copies of it. So our neocortex is big because it just replicated the same thing over and over again. Uh, and, and, and that's why our brain is bigger than a rat's brain or a monkey's brain is because we have the same basic elements, but we have more of them. Um, so this, this, there's a very rapid expansion of 
uh, the size of the neocortex. Um, so the, the evolutionary heritage of like, when did the first, you know, sort of neocortical structure appear? It's, that's debatable. No one really knows. It depends on how you measure it and so on. Um, and we can't really typically look at brains of, you know, in, you can't really mu tell much about a brain from looking at, you know, uh, fossilized bones. So um, uh, there's a lot of mysteries about that. But we do know that the neocortex, once nature figured out how to make one, um, it's made of these small elements called cortical columns. And it just, just it, our brain got big because it just made a lot more of them. <laughs> and so that can happen very quickly in evolutionary time. Yeah. And just because this is an audio uh, an, an audio interaction, is there some way you can spend a little bit of time on trying to, if there is a way, for us to for you to explain to us how do we visualize the neocortex? Is there some something yeah. we can refer to? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's first of all, everyone's familiar. With it. If you've seen a picture or a drawing of a brain, it's it's the big wrinkly thing that surrounds you know it's that mostly what you see when you look at a human brain, and it is a sheet of neural tissue. And it, the easiest way to describe it, it's about the size of a large uh, dinner napkin. Uh, you know, um, it's like uh, 1,500 square centimeters, if that helpful. Um, but you can think of it as like a large dinner napkin, dinner napkin. And it's two and a half millimeters thick on average. So it's, a, you know, it's a couple of, so it's a bit thicker than, than a dinner napkin. But, and that's, and then it, and to get it into your head, um, you know, it gets sort of wrinkled up and that's why you have these folds and creases in it. It's, it's, it's just, it's just a sheet of neural tissue and it gets a folded to fit inside your skull. Um, and then the, you can think of this, this sheet of tissue, the neurocortex, um, is, uh, is divided into different areas that do different things. So there's areas that control our vision. So when we see the world and understand what we're looking at, that's one part of the brain. One part of the neocortex, there's other parts that are responsible for vision, I mean, excuse me, for hearing and touch and language. And there's other parts that are very difficult to characterize, which are like high level thoughts and so on. You know, we, the neocortex does mathematics, it does science, it does poetry, <laughs> it does everything we think about as, as high level thought. And, um, but here's the thing that's remarkable about it even though there's these different areas, like there's the vision areas and the auditory areas and the language areas. If you look at the inside the neocortex, you look at the structure, like, in, like under a microscope, it has this very complex structure in this two and a half millimeter thickness, but it's pretty much the same everywhere. It looks almost identical everywhere. In fact, even in different species, if you look at a rat's neocortex, it looks a lot like a human's in this small detail. And so that was puzzling. And people say, well, you know, language seems different than vision, but looks like the neural circuits are the same. And so there was a famous neurophysiologist, Vernon Mountcastle, who uh, proposed many years ago. He says, well, they look, they look the same because they are the same. They're actually doing the same thing. And he says, what, you know, what makes a, a part of the neocortex, um, a visual part of the neocortex, is it's connected to the eyes. But if you connected that part of the neocortex to the ears, you get hearing. And if you connect it to you know, the output of some other parts of the neocortex, you might get language. And so this is the idea where he proposed what we now call sort of the common cortical algorithm, um, which is like there's some basic algorithm that's going on everywhere in your brain um, that seems to be doing everything we think of as intelligence. This is an amazing discovery. It's just like it's hard mm -hmm. to believe, but it's true. And then uh, he went one, one step further and he, he pointed out that uh, the way to th the neocortex is actually divided up into these things we call cortical columns. You can think of them like a grain of rice. They're very small, about a millimeter in area. And you can think of the neocortex as these little grains of rice stacked next to each other in a big sheet. And uh, there are about 150,000 of them in a human brain. Um, and that, what Mountcastle said is that every one of those cortical columns is like its own little processor. It's doing its own, it's doing the same thing. So we have 150,000 copies of something that somehow miraculously makes us, you know, see and hear and touch and understand the world and do mathematics and <laughs> great podcasts. Um, uh, and so our research is really trying to figure out, like, well, uh, what do those columns do <laughs> and um, and how do they work together? And, and so we had a real breakthrough in this, a, you know, a few years ago. We kind of figured that out <laughs> in a very broad way. And that's what the, the book is about. When you talk about the neocortex, and earlier you spoke about the old brain, functionally, if an animal had to go through uh, through life, there was no need for a neocortex, so there is a need. And would you say that neocortex is mainly the seat of intelligence and everything to come? Well, 
Although, two questions. Yeah, the first one is, um, no, you don't need to have a neocortex. Um, certainly, other mammals have a much smaller neocortex than we do, and they're fine. They're successful animals. And there's lots of animals that don't have a brain that anything like ours at all. In fact, there's even some intelligent animals. You can take an octopus. Um, you know, it's pretty intelligent, but it's, its brain is very, very different. Um, mm. uh, birds, interesting. There's some real intelligent birds. They have structures which are not called the neocortex, but um, there's some evidence suggests that they actually work on the same principles. So there's there's possibility there. Um, so you don't need to have a neocortex to be successful in the, as an animal, as a species, not at all. Um, and you mentioned uh, the Neanderthals earlier. They had a really big brain, very much like ours. They, they were they were I'm sure intelligent species too. Um, but they didn't survive. So even having a big brain doesn't guarantee you're going to survive. <laughs> you know, someone else yeah. could come yeah. along and, yeah. and uh, take care of that. But um, maybe it was the human, our species. But um, mm -hmm. so you don't need it. But it is, no, without a doubt, the seed of intelligence. There, without a neocortex, you, you're, your understanding of the world is much, much, much limited. Um, and if we think about all the things that humans have done, the amazing amount of knowledge we've accumulated in the last several hundred years or a few thousand years, if you want, you know, all that is in the neocortex. Everything we think about, you know, whether you're doing physics or chemistry or genetics or you're understanding the, the cosmos and, and uh, building telescopes or creating computers or writing code, this is all the neocortex. The, you know, the old brain is, is there just keeping us alive. Um, but, you know, all the, the, the amazing amount of knowledge and amazing technology we've created um, and all of our language is all created by the neocortex and understood by the neocortex. So if we want to understand what it means to be an intelligent species or a technological species, uh, it's the neocortex. And if we want to understand uh, the future of artificial intelligence, I've always believed and still do that we need to understand how the brain does this um, because the brain is the only, the neocortex is the only example we have of a truly intelligent system. And so um, we need to understand its principles uh, and how it works. And I wrote about that in the second half of the book, but um, a second section of the book. Um, so that, that's why, to me, it's so compelling. I mean, the other parts of the brain are really important, especially if you want to solve diseases and do various things. But if, you just, if you're interested in knowledge and intelligence, it's, it's all the neocortex. Mm. And since uh, the neocortex now and the old brain, so we're just progressively moving through the structure here. Uh, uh, is there ever any conflict? Or who who leads? Who who makes these decisions? Yeah, they, yeah. There's there's a lot of conflict. Um, in fact, it's very interesting. I get, imagine it's very in a simplistic way. Imagine that you know our brains evolved, um, and at one point in a long, long time ago, we didn't have a neocortex, but we had old, we had other brain structures, and so we were you know that was a successful species. We're here, um, and now the neocortex comes along. Well, it's an addition. It's not. It doesn't replace everything. It's an addition. In fact. Literally, the neocortex, uh, even though it controls much of our movements, like my neocortex is making my mouth and breath and you know voice box move, creating my speech. Um, even though the neocortex controls lots of our movements, it doesn't do it directly. So the neurons, the cells in the neocortex that make movement occur do not project to the muscles. They project to other parts of the old brain, which then make the movements occur. And this is interesting. You can see this. Um, for, I, I give an example. I'll give you a couple here. We'll take breathing, right? Normally, we don't think about breathing. You don't have to think about it. You can be unconscious. You're asleep. You're breathing all the time. You don't think about it. But the neocortex, if I say, oh, I can hold your breath right now. Hold it for three seconds. You can do that. That's the neocortex telling the old brain, don't breathe right now. And if I tell you to say, take a deep breath, that's the neocortex saying, okay, tell the old brain, let's, we're going to do a deep breath. But in the end, if there's a conflict, if, if you say, if I say, hold your breath, just keep holding it, the old brain is going to say, wait a second, you know, we need some oxygen here and it's going to take over and it's going to say, I'm, I'm in charge, go, we're going to breathe. And you can see this, uh, a lot of things like this, take something like coughing. You can sometimes suppress a cough, but sometimes you can't, you can make yourself cough, but, but, you know, but normally you don't have to think about it. Um, and so there's a lot of like little reflex behaviors like that, that, that the, the, the old brain uh, and the new brain conflict. And I mentioned earlier, even something like, well, you know, say you're trying to re have, restrict your diet and you don't want to eat, you know, chocolate cake. And so you leave the house in the morning thinking, okay, I'm not going to eat that chocolate cake because I'm going to be healthy. I'm trying to keep my heart healthy, whatever. 
and and then you get in the cafeteria and there's the smell of the coffee chocolate cake and you can look at the co- chocolate cake and all of a sudden the old brain says let's eat it <laughs> and then yeah, you eat it yeah. you know? so we have this conflict throughout our lives but you know like what logically what we should do and emotionally what our old brain tells us what to do and we see this playing out all the time uh, and um, so there is this conflict and I think it's a it's an interesting problem for humanity because as we create technologies that are so powerful, whether it's you know gene editing technology or whether it's you know the future of AI or whether it's nuclear weapons or so on, you know we 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 run the risk of our old brain sort of doing bad things with it. <laughs> right, um, right, right. We have to be. It's a challenge. And you were mentioning earlier that depending on the output, for example, whether it's sight or hearing, within the new uh, neocortex, is there some f- some kind of hierarchy there? Because ultimately, there has to be, th- this, because there's so much happening at one time. And as a human being, I can just do two or three things. For example, I can see at the moment and, and I, can, I can look around or turn my head. But these decisions need to be made because I'm still being bombarded or my neurons are still being bombarded, right? It, yeah, it's, well, it's somebody I, has to. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things going on in that question, Joachim. So, first of all, um, the neocortex does a lot of things at once. You may not be conscious of. In fact, you're not conscious as aware of, of, of the vast majority of what's going on in your head. Um, just take something as simple as you're looking out at. Let's say you're looking at something, anything. Just sitting. We're all. I'm looking up out a window right now, and you're looking at something. Your eyes are constantly moving. You don't, you're not aware of it, but three times a second, your eyes are moving back and forth. They're called saccades. And, and yet the world doesn't look like it's moving to you. It's stable. But every time your eye moves, the entire input from the eye changes. It's not sliding back and forth. It's a completely new input. And, and yet you're not even aware of it. And the neurons in your head are all changing, flashing back and forth. And yet you have a stable perception. So you're just not even aware of the most basic things that are going on. Um, and so you have to be careful thinking about like, oh, I'm conscious of what I'm doing. Now, most of what not not true. Most of what's what's going on in your head, you're not aware of. Um, now, so the brain can do lots of things at once, um, and you're just not aware of most of the things it's doing. You know, you as you walk down the hallway, you know, you're talking to someone, you reach out and grab a, a doorknob, and then you then you pick up your coffee cup. You're not even thinking about these things, but these are the neocortex doing those things, and and you're almost unaware that you're doing them. If I ask you to think about it, you can think about it, but other if you don't attend to it, you won't know that. So it's got a lot of things going on at once, although our conscious train of thought is more singular, uh, the things you're aware of. We could talk about what that is. And then, um, uh, and then there, is, there is some sort of hierarchy involved here. So the neocortex has traditionally been described as a hierarchical structure. That is, the inputs come from, let's say, from the eyes to, the, to part of the neocortex where it gets processed, and then it gets sent to another part, then another part, and another part. And somewhere at the top, you, know, you understand what's going on. There's some truth to this, but there's actually what we've learned in the, in the Thousand Brains Theory that it's a lot less true than we used to think in that we now realize, we're just jumping ahead a little bit here, I came, hope you don't mind, but what we've realized yeah, that's is interesting. that every, every one of these cortical columns I mentioned earlier, all 150,000 of them, each one is like a little miniature brain. Each one on its own is able to model and understand some part of the world. And so it's it's more like 150,000 intelligent agents that are working together and there's some hierarchical structure to it but each one is smart on its own and that's a new view that's not how uh, scientists and myself used to think of it we used to think of oh it's like this pyramid of control right you know information comes in and somebody at the top is in charge it's not like that at all there's 150,000 agents that are all doing their own thing and they communicate with each other and some are in different positions in the world but but there is really, it's 150,000 brains you have in your head in the neurocortex. Uh, it's a surprising um, turn of events, but uh, I'm very confident that's true. You're right. The cortical columns that you are mentioning now, and if you could get to that, because they seem to be quite the important part here. There are over so many in the brain. And do they all look similar? Do they all perform the same thing? Because they should, right? If you yeah. said the output is going to be changed and you'll get different results. Yeah. So this is, again, this, I, this has been known for a long time. It was in the 1950s that people started saying, wow, look at this. This stuff is the same. And, and that's when Vernon Mountcastle, I think actually his big paper was 1970 something. Um, mm-hmm. he, uh, he, he proposed that, you know, the, the, the cortical column is the unit of the, of the cortex and they're all doing the same thing. And you say you haven't heard of it. It's because many scientists found it hard to believe. 
they just couldn't believe it. They said, like, I don't know, how's vision the same as language? You know, you know, I don't touch doesn't feel like sight. They, and and no one knew what the cortical column did. And so it was like, yeah, okay. Uh, neuroscientists all know about this. Um, but it didn't reach more public understanding because no one could explain what was going on. And um, and a lot of research just sort of ignored it. Um, but it's not a new idea. What's new is we kind of figured out what's going on. You know, what does a cortical column do? Um, that's kind of the new thing. So it's it's been somewhat controversial because people say like, well, yeah, maybe there's these cortical columns, but you know, I don't know, maybe they're important, maybe they're not, because I don't know what they mm. do. <laughs> but the evidence right, right. to me was striking. It was like, oh my goodness, the evidence is so compelling that. Um, so again, we had to, our research then said, okay, we need to figure out what each cortical column is doing, uh, because if you figure that out, then you got the whole thing figured out, right? It's and, and it was very hard to even know where to begin on that, but. Uh, but we did make we made a lot of progress on this issue. Um, so I mean I don't know how much you want to go into it, Joaquin, but we can yeah, talk about. We will. It. We, de we definitely want to. And 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 I, I just want to close this out because you you mentioned Mount Castle and proposing what he did. So he he basically gave you the algorithm that Darwin did have for, did not have for evolution, right? Well, well, I make that analogy in the book. I said you know Darwin had a surprising observation. He said all the complexity of life was based on a single algorithm, right? Uh, and he didn't use the word algorithm, but that's we could call it that. And uh, um, and and Darwin in his day, I mean, so that was surprising. People said, "Really, a plant and a and a dog and a human are really kind of the same?" And he said, "Yeah, they're really kind of the same." <laughs> and but he didn't have any idea how this thing worked um, or where it was. He didn't know about genes. I mean, he didn't know where it was in the brain, he, body. He didn't know about genes and chromosomes and and proteins. Right? He didn't know any of that stuff. He said somehow. There's these traits we have and they're passed on. Um, where Mountcastle come along and he said something also surprising. He said, well, you know, all these things that we think about as intelligence, like vision, hearing, touch, language, music, arts, you know, <laughs> mathematics. He says, they're all the same too. And and the brain does them in the same way using the same algorithm. And people are like, huh? <laughs> really? <laughs> he goes, yep, that's the way it is. And and he didn't know what the algorithm was. He didn't, Mountcastle did not know what a cortical column did. He just said, it's got to be these cortical columns. They're doing something that's the same everywhere. And, but he knew where it was. He said, ah, you know, this is, it's located in these columns. Whatever the thing we're trying to figure out is in these columns. So he knew where it was, but Darwin didn't know where the, the genetic code was. Uh, Darwin kind of knew what the genetic code did. He said, passing on these traits. But, but Mountcastle didn't even know what the cortical column did. He said, you know, the evidence says that these cortical columns are all doing the same thing. And whatever it is, it's leading to all, every aspect of intelligence. And so, you know, he left us scratching our heads about, you know, okay, well, what is it? <laughs> yeah. And these cortical columns, do we, uh, are they visible uh, under a microscope? Well, or, it's a or very like interesting said, question. That's another reason why a little bit controversial. Um, and it's a very confusing little topic, but the cortical columns I am talking about are about a millimeter in area, roughly, they vary a bit. And um, if you look under a microscope, you cannot see them. They're not visible. It looks more continuous. There's a very detailed structure, but you don't see them divided up into these little columns. There are a few exceptions. For example, in, in a rat, there's columns associated with each uh, whisker, and they're very visible there, but mostly they're not. But we know they exist, and, and Mountcastle wrote many several papers on this, proving that they exist. And there, and his proof was was it was more in the following: if you if you take a part of the cortex that's getting input from the skin, for example. So the skin, you touch something, it sends signals to the neocortex. And there's a map of, the, of your body in the neocortex in some sense, like different parts of your neocortex correspond to different parts of your body. And what he showed was that a little area of your skin, imagine a little circular area of a skin on, your, on the back of your finger or something like that, that projects to one cortical column. And then, but in that for about a millimeter of area of the cortex, all the cells are responding to that one patch of skin. And then when you move over an invisible boundary into the next part of the neocortex, like I'm one millimeter over, now all the, the, the cells respond to a different patch of the skin. And so each, and so it, the, the columns are defined that they all get input from some place, and then the next column over gets input from another place. And, and this is true in all in vision as well, um, in the retina. So it's, it's, it's more defined by connectivity uh, than it is by some visual demarcation. Um, 
but it's it's like all these cells in the cortical column are all processing the same input, and the next area over in the cortex, the next column over, they're all processing input from a different part uh, of the brain. Again, in the rat, they have rats have the their their whiskers are a very sensitive um, sensory organ. They like see with their whiskers. And you can see these columns. There's one column per whisker on a rat. So literally all the cells in one column get input from one whisker. And then the next column over, they get input from the next whisker and so on. So you can say there are places like that where you can see the columns very clearly. But most of the times you can't see them under a microscope. But we know they're there. This is interesting. And that's just the reason I want to spend uh, or, or, or spent a little bit more time on the cortical columns because we may have to come back to that. Now, all of this is the reason we're talking about all of this is because we come to the very interesting part here where you talk about reference frames and yeah. the modeling of the world because we've kind of got the technical part now. Now, this reference frame, how would you tie this in and softly lead us into what your concept is in this yeah. theory? So we up to now, okay, we were just talking about the structure of the brain. We really haven't talked about how it worked, right? It's just like this has got these columns and they're hooked up like this and there's 150,000 of them and so on. Um, but what do they do, right? <laughs> what does a column do, exactly. right? So here's a couple of insights. One thing, a column gets input from someplace. So I just described getting input from a part of your skin. Other columns get input from the parts, parts of your retina, a little area of your retina, the back of your eye. Other ones who get parts input from different parts, the other parts of the neocortex. So they get some, so we call that a sensory input, right? You touch something or you're seeing something. It's getting a sensory input, a small part of the world it's sensing. Then the, but they get another input. And the other input is they, they get an input which tells them how the sensory organ is moving. So imagine when you move your eyes, the part of the, the columns that are getting input from the eyes are also finding out how the eye is moving. And it needs to know this, right? Because otherwise it would look like the world is just flying around, you know, but it doesn't look like the world is flying around as we move our eyes. It, the world seems stable, as I pointed out earlier. So the, the, the cortex is getting these two signals. It's getting a signal like, what are you sensing? And the other signal is, well, how is the sensor moving? So it has, we call this a sensory motor integration. So now imagine, imagine I have a finger. And the tip of my finger is going, uh, it's going to a column in my neocortex. And as I touch something with the tip of my finger, then um, the cortex knows what you're, it feels something, right? It says, oh, you're touching an edge or a rough spot or something like that. Now, as I move my finger around an object, in the book I talk about a coffee cup, I said, if I move my finger around an object, the sensation on my finger changes. Now, that could just seem like random changes, but the cortex knows how it's moving. It says, oh, you're moving in, in a certain pattern. Now, what we realize is the cortex, even a single column, has to know where your finger is in the world, where your finger is all the tips of the coffee cup. And as you move your finger around the coffee cup, it can build a model of the coffee cup. It's like, imagine I have this 3D grid and you're starting to fill in you know, an image on this three-dimensional grid by moving your finger around. And as you touch things, you say, oh, well, there's a handle over here and there's a lip over here and there's a rough spot over here. And it builds up this three-dimensional model of the thing you're touching because it knows where your finger is and how your finger is moving and it knows what it's sensing. So the big insight here was that each cortical column creates what we call reference frames. This is just like you can think of them as the X, Y, and Z, uh, X, Y, Z sort of uh, coordinate system we learned in high school. It's like that. It's different, but it's like that. And every every column is saying, okay, I'm getting input, but I'm going to build a model of the of whatever my input is. I don't care what it is. I don't even know what it is. I'm just a bunch of neurons. And I'm getting some input. The input is changing, but I know how the sensor is moving. So I'm going to construct a, a multidimensional model of the thing that I'm sensing. You can think of it literally like I'm going to build a model of this coffee cup by moving my finger over it and filling in like, oh, where are all the different parts of the coffee cup in this reference frame? And so what we realize that every column is doing this in like big time, <laughs> they're really Whoa. sophisticated. And so every part of your brain is building these, uh, these, these structured models, if you will, built on reference frames. Um, and that was a, a totally new idea. Like, you know, if some people might've said, oh yeah, that has to be happening someplace in the brain. Yeah. You know, someplace, but we've said it's happening in every single cortical column. And that was, mm. you know, to me, that was a revelation. It was like, oh my goodness, yeah. you know, all of a sudden all these things fell into place. It's no like, it's like now I know how the brain understands the world because it structures everything with reference frames 
And um, and we have 150,000 of these models running at the same time. <laughs> no, that that's super cool because, as you mentioned, when you talk about reference frames, or we can stick to the coffee cup, but uh, does that imply that uh, from the time a person is born, over a period of time, you have to first your brain has to keep developing those reference frames as you move through life, right? So, yeah. for example, if I if 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 somebody was moving their hand through a coffee cup in a jungle and the guy had grown up there and never seen a coffee cup, he would still never know it. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, we, we see this all the time. If someone shows you some really foreign thing you've never seen before, you're like, I don't know what that is. Or if I listen to some word in, you know, Russian and I don't speak Russian, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, like, what the hell is that? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it is, it's anything. When you're born, it's the, the older part of your brain has some pre-built knowledge, right? It's things like it's going to know how to walk. You don't actually, but you don't really learn how to walk. You, you just, your brain develops and you know how to walk or you don't have to learn how to cry or how to eat. You know, your brain knows how to do this, but the neocortex is different. The neocortex really has no knowledge about the world. It, it has some assumptions. It says, okay, you know, we're, we got some eyes. We're going to, you know, and we got some ears. We're going to learn visual and somatic or touch sense. And we're going to learn how things sound, but, but it doesn't know anything in particular. And it has to learn everything. It has to learn, actually even has to learn how your body moves because your body is changing as you grow and, and as you age. And so even knowing how your body is moving in the world is has to be learned. So th it's sort of like the neocortex really doesn't know anything. If I look at a column in the neocortex, it, it doesn't even know what its input represents. It, this was Mountcastle's proposal, right? It, it doesn't know that it's vision or hearing or touch or language. It doesn't know anything. He says, I'm getting some patterns that are changing. I'm going to try to figure out how to build a model of this thing. And, but at birth, you don't have any of this knowledge. And so you have to build up the entire structure of the world. Like, how's my body moving? This is the neocortex I'm talking about. It says, how's my body moving? And what is it sensing? And can I understand these things? And so a child is just constantly building these models. We're doing it and we never stop. We never stop learning. Um, you know, right. even, even like, I, I never spoke to you today before today. And, um, now I know who you are and I know that you use the Zencaster program and, you know, we, right. we had to, so I knew parts of my model about what you're doing and why your, your podcast is so interesting. So, you know, we're constantly learning, we're learning quickly. Uh, we're always updating our model of the world. And, and in the end, this is how we describe it in the book. I say, you know, the, the cortex builds this model of the world, everything, you know, it's to know something means you have a model of it in your head. It's not like you just look at it and know what it is. No, you have to already have, you have to learn a model of it all. And now you have this model in your head and it's really sophisticated about the world. It knows everything from stars and galaxies to genes and protons and, yeah. and, um, and, and how to use computers. And, and uh, yeah. we had to learn it all. And, and that's why I find this uh, reference frame so, so interesting because you gave the example of, of the coffee cup and, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think if there was something very similar to a visual reference frame. And, and I don't know if you've heard of the concept of the pareidolia, where you look at your coffee or you look at a cloud or you look at and you see patterns of, of a face and you see patterns. Of, that could be the visual representation of exactly what you said with uh, a physical stimulus. Because yeah, yeah, visually, yeah, yeah. My, art, my wife's an artist, and so I know that word from her because <laughs> they do yeah. that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, what I think is fascinating about reference frames, Akim, is that is um, not only explains how we see and understand sounds and touch and vision, but remember, every part of the neocortex is built on this. That means all knowledge, not just what a coffee cup looks like, but every part of knowledge we have is stored in reference frames. And so if you ask yourself, like, well, how do I know what, you know, the definition of fascism is or the definition of democracy or how do i know what history is or you know what how what how does how do i do mathematics it tells you that everything you know is stored in reference frames and and that 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 how information is stored and what kind of reference frames what what is the, the reference frame is, is sort of part and parcel to what you know it's like facts that are arranged in reference frames and so it, 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 it sort of taints how you view the world. Two people can look at the same set of facts, arrange them differently, and they end up with different models of the world. And, um, and also, it means that when we think what's going on in your brain, with just jumping ahead a bit, every thought you have is some neurons active. That's what it is. There's nothing mm. else. It's just neurons. There's yeah. nothing sad about this. It's really kind of exciting. But, but yeah, every thought you have is neurons active. And what's going on is you think – you can't think of everything at once. You can't, right? What you do is you you think one thought and another thought and another thought. And what's literally going on in your brain is that the 
these these things you know are sort of these locations and reference frames, and you're walking through them. You're actually going from location to location to location, recalling what's stored there. In the same way mm. that if you walk, th- you can imagine walking through your house. I can say, mm. well, Joaquin, what's you know, describe your kitchen. What you'll do is mentally walk through the kitchen and tell me where things are. That's how mm. we do all of our thinking. All thought yeah. is based on essentially retrieving information stored in reference frames, and it explains so much mm. about what everything is actually <laughs> yeah in fact that's what sherlock holmes did and and i think it was called the memory castle where you specifically try to yes. memorize stuff by placing them at different parts of your room and then walking through it so that is just an example of the reference frame but i also wanted to to think about i think for some time now there is a hack into this because if uh, get tell me if i'm wrong but if i was a formula one driver we do know the exercises that they go to before a before a, a particular format that they're going to and spend time any sports person spends time going through the particular uh, map of of where they're going to be driving and then the next day it helps them or makes it easier for them to to drive through it yeah yeah well you, you essentially you can mentally practice as well as physically practice Right. You're mm, just you're going. Exactly. And, and so the, you know, all athletes learn to do this, I guess, you know, if you're a skier or something yeah. like that. Um, right. Yeah. You could so just, I just wanted to achieve the same result. You know, <laughs> yeah, you can achieve the same result. Exactly. So now if we look at and like you were saying, we have these reference frames and that's how it works. So that now I just want to get to the next part of it where you talk about prediction. Now we know what reference frames do. Now, how do we use this and why is prediction important and how does it impact us? Yeah, so uh, I said the brain builds a model of the world. I said each cortical column builds models of its own. So we have this distributed model system. Um, Part of having a model is it makes predictions, meaning like if I was if I was about to walk from my kitchen to the living room uh, before I see the living room, I can imagine what it's going to look like. Right. And it turns out the brain is making predictions all the time about everything. Even when you just pick up your coffee cup, you're not even thinking about it. Your brain is predicting, your neocortex is predicting what each finger is going to feel. You're not consciously aware of this, um, but it does. It predicts. And so it's constantly making predictions. And let's talk about the benefit of that. And then I'll talk about the benefit of having a model in general. The benefit of prediction uh, there's lots of it. First of all, your brain is constantly testing its model. It's saying, is this model correct? If it is, then I should feel this, or I should see that. And if the model, if the prediction is incorrect, well, that's something you have to be concerned about uh, because maybe the world has changed, maybe something dangerous is happening, or maybe just like my model, the world is wrong. So as you go about your life, if any of these predictions, which you don't generally are not aware of, most of them are not consciously you're aware of, if a prediction is wrong, it draws your attention to it. So if I were to pick up my coffee cup and all of a sudden it feels like the edge is not rounded, but it's square. Like I wouldn't, I wasn't asking myself, Oh, what's the shape of the edge of the coffee cup. But if if something is different than normal, my attention is immediately drawn to it. I'll say, what's going on here? You know, and I look at it and my, you can't, you can't not do this. Um, And so what the brain is doing is saying something's different here than I expected. Let's look at it, see if it's dangerous or something like that. And if not, I need to update my model. So I may say, oh, look, my coffee cup has a crack. I didn't know that. It must have cracked last night. Um, now my model is updated and I'm not going to be sp- spooked by that anymore. Uh, so it is a, it is, if, if we start thinking about AI, it, it, you can think of it like it is the training signal. It is the, it's the way the brain trains itself without anyone telling what to do. It says, I have a model of the world and and my prediction signal is my training signal. And if the prediction's wrong, I know I have to train on that part of the world and retrain and, and update my model of the world. The benefit of the model, though, is not just prediction. That's how it keeps track of the world. And, and prediction is value because what if something was dangerous? Like, you know, hey, I didn't expect to see an animal over here. It's a tiger, right? You know. Um, but the benefits of a model of the world is it allows you to imagine the future. You can imagine what would occur if I did this. And what would occur if I did that? And if I wanted to get a, a promotion at work, what are the kind of things I might do? And I can imagine doing them and trying to imagine what would happen. Um, it also allows you to solve problems. You can say like, well, it's like I want to get from here to there. You know, um, how am I going to get from this part of the world to that part of the world? Like if I want in, in this part of the town to that part of the town, well, I can imagine different tr- routes I can take. So the model allows you to look at things and say, I could go this way or that way. This is what would occur if I went this way. You can mentally do all these exercises, just like you're talking about the car driver. 
So we do this all the time when we're thinking about how to accomplish something, even as simple as simple as like, oh, what should I do for lunch today or <laughs> whatever. Um, we have this model. We can just walk through these different scenarios and imagine what was going to happen. And we can then see the outcomes and we can choose from it. So all mm. of our the things we accomplish in life are because we have a model of the world and we try to use that model to achieve goals. And, um, you know, if we have a better model of the world, then we'll be more successful at achieving our goals. Um, so that's mm. the benefit of it. Um, um, but yeah. but prediction is this key element that allows the models to train and they tell us if mm. something unexpected happens. Right. And all this, all the reference frame information, you know, we, as we move through life, it has to be stored somewhere and we have to retrieve it in time yeah. and over time. How, how do we... How, where does, how does that happen? Yeah, well, everything in the brain, the brain is made of cells that are called neurons. And, um, and the basic idea that each neuron connects to lots of other neurons on you know, somewhere between each, each neuron makes connections of maybe five to 10,000 other neurons, a huge number. And those are connections that are called synapses. And they're like teeny little things arranged on the neuron. So a neuron looks more like a tree. It doesn't look like a cell body. It has a cell body, but it has all these branches called dendrites like a tree. And the, and the synapses, these connections are arranged along the tree like branches. So the basic theory that's been held for a hundred years or more is that uh, most of what we learn is in the, is in the connections, the synapses. And um, it was believed for many years that the learning was involved in, in, in strengthening or weakening these, these connections. We now know that most learning is involved by forming new connections. And so when you learn mm -hmm. something, literally, when you say, yesterday I didn't know something and today I do, what your brain did is it formed new connections um, between neurons, these new synapses, and, in, and that is the substrate. That's the physical substrate of memory. That's, that's where it physically is stored. It doesn't tell you like how it's stored, you know, like how's the information in those things. Um, that's a more complex topic. Um, but, but it's never stored in one connection. So if I want to learn something new, I will store, you know, dozens and dozens or hundreds of new synapses, maybe thousands of new synapses to, to store something new. Um, you can think of it this way. Let's go back to the reference frames in the coffee cup. Imagine I said, imagine you have like a bunch of cells that are representing the location on the coffee cup. These activity of these cells, maybe there's like 10,000 cells. And let's say at any point in time, uh, you know, a, a thousand are active or 500 are active. They're firing their active cells. And that activity represents a location on the coffee cup. And you have a bunch of other cells, another 10,000 cells are representing what you're feeling on the coffee cup. Oh, that's an edge or it's a curve or it's a surface, something like that. And literally what memory in this case would involve forming connections between the location and what you're feeling. So you can see you're basically pairing like a sensation. It's, it's not this simple, but I'm, I'm making it sound, you know, making it more understandable. Yeah. Um, it's like taking, it's like saying, oh, okay, well, at this location, I, I felt this. And, um, and that, that is literally just forming new connections between those two populations of cells. So that's where the memory is. It's like at this right. location, there was this thing. <laughs> right. and we'll store that so we can, re we can make that paired association again later. Yeah. Yep, that way, yep. by the way, then they said, oh, what's going to be at that location? The location cells can make the make the sensation cells say, yes, uh, well, this location, we're expecting to feel this. And literally, I can also feel something and they could say, well, I felt this at this location. So you might be at that location. You know, so it goes back both ways. You can, yeah. you know, you can, you can know if you know where you are, you can predict what you're going to sense. And if you know, if you sense something, you might be able to predict where you are. Mm -hmm. And and I think this is a great time to to after we've understood or we've got an overview of this is ask you the the million satoshi question which is what is the possibility and future possibility of whatever you've just said or whatever we know us duplicating that as far as ai is concerned now i know uh, what your overview is but we'd like to hear from you yeah and i would want to ask you specifically about uh, what sam harris says where or i think it's elon musk as well where we are going to be taken over by these particular new AI robots who are going to come in and take over the world. Yeah, um, yes. that's great. Okay. Um, well, let's just start with a premise here. Um, my premise is uh, if we're going to build AI systems that are truly intelligent, which are not like the systems we have today. The, the systems we have today are not intelligent in my mind, and most AI researchers would agree. Um, 
if we're going to build systems, I believe that we're going to use the same principles as the brain. It makes sense. Uh, we now understand what knowledge is. We understand how it's stored in the brain. We were just talking about that. Um, we know how we learn through movement. Um, we know that there's these reference frames. So I say, I very confidently predict that in the future, our AI systems will work on the same principles that we've been talking about for the neocortex. So that gives us a roadmap for building intelligent machines. And it tells me that I know what intelligent machines are going to do. I understand the kind of principles they're going to work on. Uh, that's not knowledge that most people have. Now, let's talk about the risks of this. Most people who are worried about the risks of AI are people who don't understand these details. Um, they, they say, well, the example we have is a human, and humans do all these things. Humans are aggressive. Humans want to self-preserve. Humans um, you know, care about themselves. Humans are able to subjugate other animals. So when we build AI systems, they're going to do the same to us. And uh, that's one of the fears. And, and I say, well, yeah, well, but if we're going to build an AI system, we're going to replicate the neocortex. We're not going to build the old part of the brain. We don't even have to exactly. do that. That's much more complicated, it turns out. Yeah, um, I was just thinking of that, yeah. It's like, it's like you know, and then I say, imagine, imagine this. I say, okay, think about humans. We're two things. We, are, we can divide us into two parts. One part is an animal that wants to procreate and copy itself. That's evolution, mm. right? And the other part is our neocortex, which is this thing that models the world, and it's really smart. Uh, the first part is a dangerous part. We don't want to build. We wouldn't want to build machines that want to self-replicate. We don't want to build biological systems that want to self-replicate. We don't want to do that. That's dangerous. You know, someone could build a virus that wants to self-replicate and could wipe out humanity. That's real risk. We don't want to do that. But what's the risk in building the neocortex? What's the risk of building a system that just knows, understands the world? It's not going to, on its own, just figure out, I'm going to add an old brain. I'm going to start, you know, deciding I can re recreate. I, why would it do that? It's just not going to do that. It's, it's, remember, mm. the neocortex is subservient to the old brain. It's, it's like, if we get rid of the old brain, and then the neocortex is just a modeling system. And so our future AI systems will have this intelligent component, but they're not going to have any of these things that we associate that are dangerous. They're, they're not going to want to do anything on their own. <laughs> just like, yeah. it's like, you know, a little bit like Spock or something in the, you know, the Star Trek yeah. series or something yeah. like that. Uh, um, and, and so I think, I think this, yeah, I think most people who are worried about the threats of AI just don't understand. It's more like they don't understand what's going to happen. Therefore it's, it's dangerous to them. But, but if you really understand in detail, you can see there's no harm in it. We just started touching on memory and knowledge. We didn't even get into consciousness, and I don't know how much of time you have because that's a that we, we can get really deep into that later. But uh, as we've you're talking about intelligence, and you were talking about machine intelligence earlier, is there a possibility for machines to learn on their own? And when I say learn on their own, I literally mean learn on their own. You were talking about models of the world. Yeah, I do, and I don't think it's going to happen a hundred years from now. I think it's going to happen in the next twenty years. Um, I mean, we know enough about this networking. We can we can build these things, and my company is doing that right now. We're we're working on these uh, turning this stuff into like you know practical. Well, I wouldn't say practical at the moment, but we're implementing it in software and hardware and things like that. Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, I think this is a, you know as opposed to a threat to humanity. I think this is a, this will be a crowning achievement of humanity when we when we're able to actually build machines that help us learn quicker and faster. I mean, you and I and, and most of your listeners are very interested in understanding how the world works. And um, and now we have machines that help us do this. Um, and they will learn on their own. On their own is a little bit like, I don't mean they're going to learn on their own and keep it secret from us or something like that. I mean, they're going to learn on their own in the sense that, you know, um, we all, each individual human learns on our own, but we share knowledge with each other, right? So, uh it's uh, yeah, I, I I see no reasons. I see no technical scientific reasons why we cannot build machines that work like the neocortex and learn and build models of the world. I see very few philosophical dilemmas about it. Um, I think as a very, very powerful technology, we have to worry about humans misusing it. Um, we have to, you know, it could be in the hands of the wrong people. Very intelligent machines could be, you know, just like today's AI could be used to track people or subjugate them or mislead them or whatever. So those are real risks we face from any powerful technology. 
and um, intelligent machines will be no different. So we have to be careful about that. I'm not like saying this is not completely risk-free, um, but the risks are how humans inv- work involved in this, not the, the inherent technology itself. Um, you know, cell okay. phones can be used for terrorism and so can computers and so can, you know, tell, you know, anything. Right. Um, but, mm. uh, but on their own, they don't do anything bad. And that's true with AI systems. They're not going to on their own do anything bad yet. Many people think they will, but they just don't understand yet. Mm. You were talking about drive and inherent drive. And we were speaking about the neo- neocortex for a human being. It, it all also highly depends on the inputs right but if we do create a neurocortex for 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 a machine or an intelligent being then those inputs would have to come from humans no no Uh, no look uh, you can build a machine that has that that senses the world just like we sense the world right i mean whether it has something equivalent to the eyes or some other sense um radar doesn't really matter it has a bunch of sensory organs it has a way of moving those sensory organs through the world in some way and um, it can learn a model of the world. And, you know, we can build, I, I described this in the book a bit, you know, we could build machines that are very, very different than you might imagine, that are extremely tiny, that just work in very, very tiny domains and, you know, manipulate proteins. Or we can build machines that work on very, very large scales that, you know, sense, sense the entire ocean at once, um, you know, things that humans can't do. Um, so we don't have to think like these are like human-like things. Um, they're just, it's just a modeling system. It's a way of censoring data and uh, building models of it and understanding what is going on. Would we ever able to build an intention like uh, humans that and intentions that change with the environment? Do you see that as... Well, I, first, first of all, obviously, an intelligent machine, as I've described it, it, it doesn't have its own goals, right? It doesn't sit there and go, hey, my goal is to get a better salary or I want more electricity or something like that. Um, uh, and so in some sense, humans have to provide the goals. You know, it, and this is what we do today in any technology, right? You know, so if I wanted to make a, a car that was truly intelligent, well, what were the goals that car would be, you know? Um, um, and we might have to build in some, and we'd have to build in some safeguards. We have to sort of build the equivalent of the old brain functions, but they wouldn't be like our old brain. They would be like, oh, the, this thing is to, is to transport people as they ask, but not, to, not harm anyone. That's the goals of this system. Um, and, but the system's not going to wake up one day and say, you know, I'm tired of driving car, you know, being a car. I want to be a, you know, a, you know, rocket scientist <laughs> and do something yeah, else. Yeah. Um, so it, just think of it as like a tool. It's like a, like a computers are a tool. Um, uh, and we have to tell them what we want them to do here. We have to provide sort of the overall goals for the intelligent machine. Like what is it, it's, it's attempting to do. Um, and, um, but it won't develop those on its own. That's the important part. Um, it, it, there's no evolutionary mechanism that's going to say one day it's going to wake up and say, I'm tired of being a, you know, a, a robot that, you know, does laundry. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm going to take over the world. You know, that's not yeah, going to happen. Yeah. Can, can you imagine if you have a robot that wakes up every morning with a different mood like us? Yeah, exactly. Why, why would we want our robots to have moods? I mean, I, I wouldn't yeah. want my robot. Yeah, it's like, I'm exactly. tired today. I don't want to do this. I mean, yeah, what's the point if you have a robot who, who, who doesn't feel like uh, helping you that day? Yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, I painted a very f- sort of fanciful uh, example in the book, but I think it's a real example, and, I, and I'm not going to shy away from it. Imagine we want to live on Mars, and we need to build habitats on Mars for humans. We need to terraform Mars. We need to you know, give, provide it an atmosphere. And so, There's no way in the world humans are going to be able to do this. It, we, we, we can't live on Mars even, even for a short period of time. But we could build intelligent robots that do all this stuff for us if we wanted to. That would be like, you know, intelligent construction robots and engineers. And they could work up there and work in that environment and build things for us. And, you know, uh, and they'd have to think on their own. They'd have to solve problems on their own. Uh, but they would be taking guidance from us on what, what we want to accomplish. I think that's actually going to happen, Joaquim. Um, I don't know how long that will take, but you know, that kind of thing will happen. And uh, and so that's kind of like, well, this, you know, it, it could really change the, the, the destination of humanity in some sense. Uh, you know, we, intelligent machines can help us solve our problems here on Earth. They can help us understand the universe. They can help us, um, uh, you know, explore the, our solar system. And in and, and the third part of the book, I write about these things. And also, I think they'll be able to uh, allow us to extend our knowledge acquisition, our ability to understand. We can send intelligent machines throughout the unit, throughout the galaxy, at least, um, to not to colonize and take over, but to help us understand it better. 
um, and to you know go out and do do knowledge acquisition for us in some sense. So I think these are these sound fanciful, but I think all this you know the future is turns out to be a fanciful, and I think uh, these things will happen. Um, and I, in some sense, I think intelligent machines uh, are will let us like, survive longer, and they'll let us um, um, be more successful, and ultimately uh, preserve our knowledge um, after we're gone. Uh, in some ways, <laughs> and and Jeff, you say this is for the these things will happen in the future. There are a lot of people who say these things are happening currently, but from the other way around, that we are being visited by exactly what we are trying to create or what you were talking about, where you send out, uh, you don't send out your species, but you send out the robots. So yeah. if there is anything that we do encounter first, we are not going to en- encounter the core species. It's just going to be it's going to be their technology first. Um, I I don't think there's any good evidence for that today. Um, it really isn't. And, um, you know, it would be wonderful. It was true. And I would love it. <laughs> uh, yes, you, know, you had recently had, uh, Seth Sostak on your, from SETI Institute. He was on your podcast and, um, and, uh, you know, I, I write about SETI in the book a bit because, you know, it, it's, there's a very good chance that intelligent life has, has existed throughout the universe many times, but most of it's gone. That you know, even if our if our if our we as a technologically advanced species last, maybe we only last for ten thousand years. Well, if that is typical. Then the vast, almost all the technologically advanced species that ever existed are no longer, and we won't find them out there. Um, so you know, I don't know. We don't know what's happening. I think the 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 the, the chances of there being a technologically advanced species elsewhere is probably pretty high. Um, the question, have they survived long enough for us to be at coexisting time with them? I don't know. And um, I think we have the opportunity of creating machines to outlast us. But at the moment, I don't think if they exist elsewhere in the universe, I don't think they visited us. Uh, we, don't ha- we don't have good evidence for that. Uh, and we don't have any good evidence that they're trying to signal us. So at the moment, we just don't know. Um, but uh, I would assume at the moment that we're not being, I, I don't, at the moment the evidence is squarely in the camp of, no, there's nobody here. It's just us. <laughs> we're trying to figure this yep. out. <laughs> it, like they say, it's scary both ways. If it's only us, it's scary. And if there are many out there, I, yeah, that's scary I, I, as well. I find it more scary if it's only us, because if it, it, that yeah. tells us that our future is pretty precarious. <laughs> Um, yeah. if there were lots of intelligent species and we just haven't found them yet, well, in fact, if we did find them, I feel much, much better. Like, oh, we have a chance yep. of surviving too. Again, you have yep. to imagine, would, would intelligent species want to like, you know, travel across the galaxy to our little planet to what, eat us or, you know, consume us? I mean, come on. At this point, if they have the technology to do this, they're not, they don't need us. They don't need our planet. Yeah. Um, why yeah. would they do that? And if, and if they were like aggressive, you know, conquistadors, they probably wouldn't have survived. So, you know, if there is intelligent life in the universe and we haven't found it yet, it's almost uh, certainly benign. Um, right. And uh, they'd be watching us saying, hey, how are, they, what, how are these guys doing? You know, are they going to survive or not? <laughs> Where are we in the chain? And yeah. So, Jeff, we were talking about, uh, we were talking about the 150,000 uh, parts of your brain and everything that is working together. So how come there's just one person? How come it's just me? How come I just feel there's one one consciousness or one person making a decision if there's so many people or so many things in my head uh, in yeah. play? Yeah, it, it, that was that was it's counterintuitive and that was one of the why this this solution uh, that each each column is a complete model was was perhaps overlooked because it doesn't feel that way. Uh, but what we what we we now understand it and it's it's pretty interesting. Um you have a, you have these all these different models in your head. They're all working independently in some sense, but they they communicate with each other and they vote. Uh, we call it voting. You can imagine I have let's say I have hundreds of columns or thousands of columns that are trying to model the coffee cup in my hand. Each part of my skin only touches one part of the coffee cup, and each part of my skin can only know a little bit about the coffee cup at once. And and so on its own, the tip of one finger really can't tell me what I'm touching unless I move it around. But, but what happens is if I grab the coffee cup with my one hand and now I've got many parts of my skin touching it, each part says, I don't know what this is, but I have a bunch of hypotheses. And they share their hypotheses and they vote. They kind of they reach a consensus. They say, well, what is the, what's consistent that we all know about coffee cups and all these other things, but what is consistent with all the sensations we're having at once at this moment? And 
and they do this literally by sending these uh, these these neurons that send these signals across the surface of the or you know from one area of the neocortex to the other, and they reach a consensus, and they settle in on that consensus. So the consensus would be like, oh yeah, we all have a little bit of information here. It's kind of conflicting, but the one thing that makes sense is it's a coffee cup, and um and they all reach that conclusion, and you go, yep, I know what this is. Now, so as you move your fingers. They're all changing, inputs are changing, but it's still the same coffee cup. So as I move my fingers over the coffee cup, I don't feel like the coffee cup is changing or moving or, or something different. The voting is still saying, it's still the same coffee cup, it's still in the same position. And that's mostly what we sense in the world. Mostly what we are perceiving is this voting neurons. The neurons are saying, yep, this is our agreement. I mentioned earlier when you, I said you can you move your eyes back and forth, these saccades, and you're not aware of it. What you're aware of is the voting. The voting neuron saying, I'm looking at a window and the window's not, you know, window's in one position, even though the input to my brain is changing left and right and all the columns are getting different inputs, it's the voting neurons are saying, nope, it's still the same window. It's not changing. It's right there. So our, our conscious perception is just a small part of what's actually going on. It's just what's being, what is the group consensus of these, these, um, these columns that are voting uh, to reach a consensus. And when we remember things, that's mostly what we remember. We remember this group consensus. We're just not even aware of the other stuff that's going on. Mm. That's why you, you know, use the thousand brain series. You have like thousands of these things modeling the same object, but you're not aware of it. It's, it feels like one perception. Uh, is there a ghost in the uh, is there a ghost in the machine? And and how do we tackle consciousness? Because is that something that uh, we leave out of this? And how would you tackle that? Well, I mean, consciousness is a very controversial topic. A lot of people think it's like impossible to understand and so on. Um, the evidence we have is, no, it's not impossible to understand at all. It's a bunch of neurons. There's no magic going on. There's no ghosts in the machine. I mean, it, it, we don't, you know, we don't, we don't there's no, ex, there's nothing that we've learned about the universe that tells us that, that that's true. Um, I actually think there's a fairly straightforward answer to what we conceive of consciousness. And I wrote about this in the book, in a, in a book uh, about it. A chapter on machine consciousness because i think machines can be conscious if we want them to be um and i'll just describe it to you very briefly i mentioned earlier that every thought you have is a bunch of neurons becoming active and that's it that's it you know it's like the thought is this neurons and it switches to this thing and this thing you know it's like walking through your house imagining the different parts of your house um well you can remember that literally the neurons can store that sequence of thoughts. They can remember their own activation state. So I can think about something. I'll remember I thought about it. And so I can re-invoke that memory. So if, I, if I'm if i in the living room and I say, oh, I'm going to go to the kitchen to get a, um, a glass of juice, I get to the kitchen and I say, well, why am I here? He said, oh, I remember the thought. I was in the living room and I wanted a glass of juice. Okay, that's why I'm here. This idea that you store your memories as they occur, not just not just the the not af, not just the actual experiences, but the actual memories of what you were thinking, or stored, um, gives us you this sense that you know you know where you are in the world, you know why you got there, you know what am I doing? Um, you can say why am I here? You can remember why you're there. If you didn't store these memories of your thoughts, if you didn't store, you can think of these as we call them activation states. Right? If you didn't store these different activations of the neurons. You would get to the kitchen and say, I have no idea why I'm here. I'm just in the kitchen. You'd be like a zombie. You would be walking around moment to moment, not know why you got there, not even knowing you had a past. Um, you just So this idea that we have this, this we are able to invoke this uh, state of uh, previous memory thoughts, memory states, and go back and forth like the present and the past and the future gives us our sense of why I'm here, how, why, how did I get here, what am I doing right now? This is all understandable in terms of neurons, and I believe that is the month. It's not the only part of consciousness, but that's the key part. That's the part that says, I'm aware, I'm here, who am I, you know, why did I get here? And and you also ha you have a model of your own body, so you're remembering what your body did. Uh, my body was over there, now it's over here, now I'm going to be out to go over there. And so it's just, a, it's just this flow of storage states that gives you this sense that I'm present in the world. Um, and it can be really understood, and we can't. We have the option of giving it to machines. Uh, many of intelligent machines would want to do this. If we, if we're going to build those robots building, you know, um, space stations or you know, habitable uh, habitats on Mars, they have to remember why they're there. They have to remember, oh, I left the tool over on that bench. You know, <laughs> I, I, mm, I'm mm. looking for the screw. You know, um, yeah. and these things, these are what give you a sense of consciousness. I don't think there's anything else 
Um, there's another part that's called qualia, uh, uh, which is like why things feel the way they do. And I wrote about that too. Um, but I think it can all be explained. I think in the future, we're not going to worry about consciousness. It's not going to be a mystery. Um, now, I know that's a, 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 an unusual position, but I'm pretty confident in it. Yeah. No, it's interesting because uh, you were mentioning about the moment you think about something and then it gets into your memory bank and, and we remember. But I think with consciousness, a lot of people want to know about before the thought. How does that thought occur? Because once the thought occurs, then it pretty much, uh, we do understand how that sequence works. You know, but yeah, this gets the around the issue occur. of free will, right? Like, did I think that? Did, did my, I mean, where did that thought come from? I, I argued, Joaquin, that that thought is literally the invocation of neurons, right? Mm -hmm. And so okay. those neurons got invoked because some model in your head was a location was specified and the and the stored uh, thought came out and that it is literally that there's nothing else it's just that the thought is those neurons being active if if you are unwilling to believe that then fine but there's no place it, there's no obvious place or any place that we know of in the brain where a neuron could become active without the causal events leading up to it it's like w why would this cell all of a sudden, uh, uh, some finger comes in and says, you know what? There's no reason for you to do this, but I'm going to tell you to become active. Like, who? Who's telling you? <laughs> it's like yeah. nobody. But yeah. the point is, we, we feel like we're making these decisions because we can look back and say, well, how did I get here? I got here because I did this and this and this. And, and, but in reality, there there's, doesn't appear to be any room or need for someone else to say what was prior to that thought it's just a bunch of cells becoming active because some other cells were active which because some other cells were active and um it's a it's a causal chain of activations and there's no place for some you know uh, finger of consciousness to come in and, and mess things up <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah but uh, just thinking of it in that case we were talking about uh, robots taking over so how does this play into the fact that if this is the case, then with time and with evolution, and if it is just uh, neurons, then the robots are going to go through the same process. But, and but one you, day, yes, they are going to wake up with moods and thoughts. You said own, right? if there's evolution, right? Well, that's the key thing. I make this point. The dangerous thing that we can do from a, building a technology or make things that reproduce self-reproduction and evolve, that is dangerous. I agree with that. And whether that's a virus or an intelligent machine, we do not want things that self-reproduce and can evolve. Okay. So don't do that. And just because you make something intelligent is not going to make it able or willing or desirable to self-reproduce. It's in fact, if I build an intelligent machine, you know, out of silicon and hardware or whatever, how's it going to reproduce? I mean, it, it's, it's not going to do it unless we go out of our way to make it so somehow we can reproduce. It's just, you know, self-reproduction with evolution. We'd have, to, we'd have to work really hard to make that happen. Don't do that. And I, and I made it earlier, I think it's far more easier to, to, to create a threat to humanity just by making a new virus. It doesn't have to be intelligent. You know, intelligence is an option. <laughs> self-reproduction. <Yeah. laughs> self-reproduction is the dangerous part. Yeah, and then we, we can get into so many, we can get into so many other problems because of that. Because then you're going to have not not one type of species, but so many more different species with different. If it goes in that direction, types yeah. of, of of drives. Because I think at one time we would have had about fourteen or fifteen of us. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, as the Again, Homo sapiens the, around. Just I just the, the walk away message for people: self reproduction with evolution is dangerous. Intelligence on its own doesn't have nothing to do with that. Intelligence can help a self-reproducing species like ours, but it is not on its own going to reproduce, want to reproduce, or able to reproduce, or anything like that. Um, yeah. So we have to be careful of self-reproduction. That is a very dangerous thing. I'm much more worried about people creating viruses that wipe out humanity. That is, that's an easy thing to do. Yeah. So for all the students listening to this podcast, I hope you heard what Jeff has just highlighted and red flagged. So because there are a lot of people listening to you, Jeff, and, and building up thoughts and minds in the future. But uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about Numenta and, and your organization and what do you guys plan to move towards in the future and give us a broader yeah. understanding of where yeah. do you see this whole game going? Yeah. So um, I had sort of two very long term goals in my life. And those goals are also shared by Nementa. The first goal is to understand the brain, specifically the neocortex, but understand, you know, what the things we've been talking about, you know, what's going on in our heads? How's the system work? 
But I also realized a long time ago that that is going to be the basis for creating truly intelligent machines. So our second goal is to take what we've learned from neuroscience and, um, and to be a catalyst for the future of AI. And I use the word catalyst, meaning we want to accelerate that future. We want to make it happen quicker uh, based on the, what we've learned about um, from the brain. And so Nementa, until, until about three years ago, was almost all neuroscience. Uh, that's pretty much what we did. <laughs> um, and then we started, we really made some significant progress as we've been talking about. And so now for the last three years, we've been transitioning to being mostly uh, machine learning and AI. And so we're, we are now s sitting with a different problem. The problem is, let's take all the things you and I just talked about, the brain functions and how it works. How would it actually go about building intelligent machines that work on this? How, what's the first steps we do? How do we, you know, what are the things... How do you get there, right? You have this vision, but it's a big vision and there's all these technical issues that have to be resolved and how do you get there? So we're working on that now. We're building out, uh, we have a roadmap for how we think we can get from today's machine learning, which is clearly not intelligent, to a future where machines are intelligent or at least some of them are, and the different aspects of the thousand brains theory and how they have to come into play and how we would implement them technically and, and physically engineering problems so we're trying to do that um my goal is to be you know if i if we're successful that five years from now that many of the principles we've talked about um would be widely recognized in the machine learning community and many of them would be um would be uh, part of neural networks and part of ai uh, in some sense um so how do we get from today's ai to the future where machines really are truly intelligent um we're tackling that problem and it's not easy uh, it's not obvious, uh, all heart, you know, and here's a lesson for your students. You know, every, if you want to do something that's really impactful, uh, it's never going to be easy. You're just, you're just going to be constantly faced with questions and dilemmas and not knowing the right path. And you just have to accept that, um, and, and work at it. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're, we are now implementing this stuff in, mach in machine learning algorithms and, uh, trying to, um, you know, create, you know, we've done this. We've been able to make uh, a tr uh, classic artificial neural networks. Some of them run 100 times faster using the techniques, some of the techniques uh, we've learned from the brain. Um, so that's that's our that's our plan. Uh, to, it's not to build, you know, not the world domination, but really to be a catalyst for the future of AI. Yeah, and I think Numenta has, as you, you, you guys really walk the talk, because I do know that you have several platforms and you do, op uh, you do offer open source licenses where other developers can use the technology. We, we share. are very open. We, you know, we do something unusual. Uh, so we, we, even, we even record our internal uh, research meetings. Where we, where we, you know, we yell at each other and and argue and put up ideas that we, you know, turn out to be stupid later. We we post we post those on the on the web. If you want to watch it, you can. It's like you know we're we're being open about it. So uh, yeah. there's no secrets here. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's why I found that so impressive with Numenta. I have noticed and I have found that most of even your licensing and people can use your stuff to develop further so you guys are actually you, you actually uh, live what your values are as far as your organization is concerned that's, yeah, which, that's which really commendable well you know well we're in a very fortunate position in the sense that we we're not required right at the moment to make a profit <laughs> so yeah. um we're self-funded uh myself and others and um so uh, we don't have the constraints that most people have. Uh, we can say, you know, this is like research and we can figure it, we can take our time. Uh, we can involve as many people as possible. We can be as open as we want, you know, we can. Uh, we're trying to choose something bigger than ourselves. And, and, you know, ultimately, I, you know, I believe that I will create value for our shareholders, but we're very, very patient. Um, you know, Nementa has been around close to 20 years and, and, uh, you know, that's, and we don't have, we don't make a profit. <laughs> so yeah. not many yeah. companies can do that, but, um, it's, it's sort of a hybrid model of a, of a, a, a very open public research with the potential for, um, um, you know, a profit sometime in the future. Mm. And how concerned are you, or have you ever been concerned about, you spoke about self-replicating AI or for some need to have. A compliance mechanism globally because there are different players there are people with different intentions coming in with different goals uh, somebody may not have the same intention that you have and and come up in some other part of the world or is currently working on some system in some other part of the world 
and we are then we just get to know when it's ready. Yeah. So I think again, if you ask me, do do we need some sort of you know agreed upon uh, constraints? Yeah, I think we do. But let's start with the really dangerous ones. You know, what about um, you know it's so easy now to create new genetic um, sequences or even entire genomes. You know. I do worry about our ability to create some small group of people or even one person to be able to create, you know, a, a very, very deadly virus that could you know, wipe out humanity. So we have to confront that problem. That is a real problem. You know, the gene editing stuff is there. In terms of AI, we are very, very far away from anybody being able to build something that's sophisticated, big machine that can self-replicate and evolve. It's It's not... It's not easy. It's it's like I don't even know where you begin on that. It's a very very hard problem. So it's not imminent. It's not like oh tomorrow two guys in a garage are going to come up and say yeah, I've made an evolving AI that self replicate replicates. Nah, I don't think so. You might be able to do that um, in you know like a computer virus, um, but not like a you know physical structure like a human or something like that. We're really far from that. Um, I think today we have to be concerned about the the risk of applying existing AI and, and near term AI. You know, what about weaponizing AI, you know, making intelligent weapons that can, you know, be mass produced and kill lots of people, things like that. I think those are the kind of things like we have uh, treaties on, um, you know, chemical warfare and things like that. I think we need to develop those here, too. Uh, so I think there is uh, a need for uh, constant dialogue and governments to and uh, to get together and say, you know, w- what are the risks that are real uh, that we have to deal with uh, self-replicating AIs that take over the world are not an imminent threat. And so I don't worry about that. But, you know, weaponized, you know, AI, yeah, I'm worried about that. You know, I don't want somebody, you know, you know being able to, like, send drones all over the world to kill people. I mean, who knows? So, uh, uh, if, you know, like any technology, we have to really be honest about what the, what the real risks are. And, you know, I, I think genetic engineering is one and um, the, the misuse of AI is another. Hmm. And and Jeff, this has been such an amazing conversation uh, for all for, for everyone listening. I'm sure, and they want to hear more. I would definitely encourage them to get the book, A Thousand Brains. It's available here in India. It's on Amazon. It's available on in on hard copy as well. And we just surface touched most of what uh, Jeff has been talking about. But it's super interesting if you want to listen to it a little bit more and understand. So we definitely encourage them to get that book and. Before we let you go, Jeff, uh, is there something that you would want to talk to people who are listening to us here? And like I said, 80 to 90 percent of our listeners here are, are students who are in universities, people who are choosing their careers. And maybe a lot of them, after listening to you, are, uh, are probably planning or were planning to get into the AI space. What would your overarching message to these people be? Well, that's interesting because, you know, when you write a book like The Thousand Brains book, um, you have to imagine your audience. And the audience I imagine is just the audience you described. I imagine people who are young, who are about to enter their their career, make their career choices, um, and I wanted to reach them uh, because I think this is not only a super interesting and exciting field um, to be involved in, one that's going to be super growing for the next you know hundred years. Um, and so that would be a great place to work. But I also think it's super important for everything <laughs> for the future of our society and, and humanity. So um, I really wanted to reach people who and, and get excited about this and would want to make a career out of this in one way or the other. Or if they're in another field, at least be aware of these ideas and understand how it might affect you. Like if you want to become an educator, well, you know, the, the ideas in the thousand brains have a lot of talk about what is knowledge and how is it stored in the brain. You might, you'd probably want to know that. So, you know, I'm hoping that a lot of people who are young and are about to start their careers will read the book and get motivated in one way or the other to work on it. Uh, my only, uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, it's, it's it's a new field. It's evolving. We're figuring it out right now. And so it's not easy. It's not like you can just say, oh, I'm going to get a degree in a thousand brains. And you know, like, no, you're going to have to work pretty hard at it. Um, but it's worth it. And um uh, and I hope that uh, I hope that some of your listeners will become motivated and, and want to do that stuff. Jeff, from everybody here at Indian Genes, from all of us, it, I would not want to end this if it was not for the limitation I have on my recording platform. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah, we're, we're but, an hour and a half. So. Yeah, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And I hope uh, 
I've spent my time well. I, I, I'm sure everybody listening to us is going to be enjoying this. I just hope you spent your time well as well. And I did. We would love I, to see I, you. I, or we would love to hear you again, Jeff. Well, well, you know, if you want to do that sometime, you can. Just, you know how to reach me, um, and, um, and Christy manages all this stuff. So I was happy to do that. Um, yeah. So you know, the, I, I live for this, right? This is the point of all this. Is the point is to influence other people. And um, and so I and your questions were great, Joachim, and I thought the conversation was really fun uh, and exciting. So um, yeah, it was great. I want to thank you for having me on, and um, I hope uh, people listened to it got it got something out of it. This Hub Hopper original को सुनने के लिए आपका शुक्रिया. अगर आप भी अपना podcast launch करना चाहते हैं, तो Hub Hopper Studio website पे register करें और एक मिनट के अंदर अंदर अपना खुद का podcast launch करें. यही नहीं स्टूडियो देता है आपको पूरी आजादी कहीं भी कभी भी अपना पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करने की सिर्फ तीन आसान स्टेप्स में तो साथ में अपना पॉडकास्ट शुरू करने के लिए तैयार जस्ट हॉप ऑन हब हॉपर सिंपली कंटेंट